I love that. Seeing people that we hadn't seen in a while. So it's great to see you all. We got a great crowd across our campus today. And all of you online, we welcome you as well. We're so glad that you're here with us. Stay with us. I'm excited about this message today. I think it's going to be a unique kind of message for us. I want to start with a question. I want you to think back the most memorable Christmas you've ever had, ever in your life. Now, I've got a lot of great memories of Christmas. I love Christmas. I have great memories as a kid. But probably my most memorable Christmas, and by the way, it might be this one, right? As we get older, it's going to be like uh, 2020, like everything else. But my most memorable Christmas was actually, it actually took place Christmas night. So Stacy and I were dating, not yet engaged. Uh, I was in seminary. Uh, I lived in North Carolina, or formerly, then I was in Charlotte with my family back in the home I grew up in, and Stace came to visit us. We'd been dating here. Uh, in Texas, and so I'm home for the holidays. She came, and uh, some of you may have heard this story, but it, it, it was the night of Christmas, and we're exchanging gifts with one another, and um, I had a few gifts that I gave her. The last one, the third gift was that she opened up was, was a Bible, and uh, it, it was a leather-bound Bible, and down in the bottom right-hand corner was etched her name, but it said Stacy S., not Smith, Warren. And she, she looked at it, she goes, oh, wait, what? Wait, what? And so she took it out, and I was like, hey, do you like it? And, and I was kind of like, do you, you know, look, look at it. Do you like it? And sure enough, she opened it up. You know, she's like, first, yeah, I like it. It's good. Then finally she opened it up, and it fell open to uh, Psalm 37, verse 4, where I had taken the bookmarker, tied the ring, tied the engagement ring there, and it opened up to to Psalm 37, verse four, which says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now that's not to say that, you know, we delight in him, he'll give us whatever we want, whatever we desire. When we delight in him, his desires become our desires. That had become our, that had become our verse as we were dating and, and really praying. You know, when we saw, saw this is getting serious, we said, Lord, we just want your will to be done, not ours. So you keep pressing us on, give us greater infection for each other or, or in this. So he kept pushing us, you know, in greater love for each other. Time came. So I then, uh, it might've been me, maybe we, we took the ring off the, the bookmarker and I got down on one knee and said, so there's a Christmas tree and we're, I mean, it's just a moment. And I, I'm like, my life is changing forever right now. And so I, I didn't expect this. I was putting the ring on her finger and, and I literally started shaking. Like I couldn't, okay, I'm going to get that on there. You know, she's, she's like, I need some help. And so we, we got the ring on and we just praised the Lord and uh, kind of prayed together. For me, that was the moment. Like sometimes, you know, in life, there's a moment in time where you'll never be the same again. And you know it in the moment. And, and today what we're going to do is look at Mary, focus in on her and a Christmas Eve the, the first Christmas, the only Christmas there's ever been, the rest are just celebrations of the one. And we're going to see a moment that changed her life clearly forever. And we're going to back up from Luke 2 and go back to the story that really set it all up. She was with her fiance as well, right, Joseph. And today we're going to look at that passage. But uh, here's what I want to do. I want us all today, we're going to come home to love. That's our focus today. And we're going to jump to Luke 2. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there to Luke chapter 2. We're going to start there. We'll, be a, we'll jump around a little bit. So grab your Bible if you don't have it there at home. Luke 2, of course, is where we find the story, the Christmas story. And it's there that we find this one verse that stands as an outlier among all the craziness that's going on, the happiness and the joy of the shepherds. The angels have come and announced Jesus' birth. He's now born, so Mary now has already given birth to Jesus at this point. And in Luke 2, 19 it says this we've talked about this verse a little bit but mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart okay so but in contrast to the shepherds and understandably bursting with joy and all that good stuff mary becomes this kind of non-anxious presence in the story she stands out as as really coming at this thing differently the message what we've looked at a lot that we've looked at a lot this month um, it says this, Mary kept all these things to herself. This is a good translation, holding them dear, deep within herself. Uh, so so she, she models for all of us what I want you to do this week. If you haven't already, we, we want to slow down. I want you to slow down. I want you to take a moment to ponder. And that's what we're doing today. I want you to think about the great love of God for you. Our Advent guide has done that for us. And if you haven't jumped in, you can do so. It's online there. Uh, and you, you can jump in, and there's a few days left, 
And uh, it has meant the world to us. As we've talked about it, many of you, I know it's been a great um, gift to me as we've walked each morning, just coming back to his love, coming home to all that we come home to in Jesus. So there's a time to rest. And I just want to encourage you in that as we start our time together. There's a time to stop. We talk so much about following Jesus and, and serving him and doing that. But there's a way to become that you become so busy for God that you leave God out of the equation. I tell our, our ministers, our staff team all the time, I say it this way. You can do the work of God in such a way that it destroys the work of God in you. And I've seen it. We get busy serving him. And we don't first ponder his great love for us and remain there. That's what I want to talk about. What it is to come home to his love. How can we avoid that kind of life that eliminates God in our serving of God? How do you do that? Two words. You've already seen them. The first one is treasure. This, this word in the Greek means preserved or kept up, tucked away, to remember, not forget. To, to realize that in the moment, my life will never be the same. And what was it for her? She's looking at her baby boy. I just kind of imagine in that moment, she's holding baby Jesus. I want to ask how many moms are, are watching me online right now? You can raise your hand in the room. How many of you are moms right now? Because you moms, you all will understand this message today more than any of us. Think about this. Mary had a relationship with Jesus. I could argue she loved Jesus, her son, in a way that no one else in the world ever has or ever will. And moms will understand this story better than any of us. Because a mom holds this newborn baby right after nine months. I mean, maybe it was after some morning sickness early on. Your entire body is transformed by this baby. And then the baby comes, the, the challenge of, of labor. There's been sleepless nights. And now she's looking at the baby and she's treasuring all that she had seen and heard. And it comes long before Luke 2. We're going to talk about that today. The other word is ponder. This word means to meet. Literally, it means like when two people come to meet. It means to come together, even, even to wrestle. So she's, she's wrestling in her mind. What does all this mean? She's really thinking about it. And this is what I want us to do. This is a discipline treasure and ponder the love of God for us. Sometimes we just write it off like, yeah, he loves us as if he loves us like we love each other. But I want us to scrutinize, get underneath it all, because here's the truth I want you to see today. We come home to love when we treasure and ponder God's love for us. So what was she treasuring? What was she pondering? You know, uh, you probably have heard the song this season. Um, Mary, did you know? I'm going to make the case today. Uh, yes. Yes, she knew, okay? And she didn't know all things. It's a legit song, but she knew. And her entire life was changed. And we're gonna see what she knew today. And I think it's just been blowing my mind this week, focused on Mary. She shows us what it means to come home to love. Now, consider Mary, okay? Before we move on, consider Mary. Often we see her, um, here in the modern West, at least, the global West, we see her as probably white, she probably, she may have blue eyes, maybe even blonde hair. Um, she's wearing what I'd call, you know, Carolina blue robe. She has a white uh, shawl. She's wearing, I mean, all the Christmas, you know, pageants. She kind of looks like that. Maybe she has a halo. If you bust it out in the nativity scene, she often has a halo. Most Protestants uh, have spent more time debating about Mary than we've actually really accepted her or, or you know, attempted to make her our own. And so we talk about what she's not more than talking about who she is. Think about that, right? And in and, and, and some way, legitimately so. Uh, but not at the risk of, of then embracing her as our own. We talk about she's not a saint, okay? She's not sinless. She's not an intercessor. We don't pray to her. We don't pray through her. Christ alone is our intercessor. He alone is the Savior. But that what happens, though, she becomes this little figure that, like I've done at my house. Some of y'all know I collect nativity scenes. We got lots of them. And so she comes out. We put her out, and there she is. And then we wrap her up and put her away, you know, quietly. For us, Mary is just kind of meek and mild. Um, when you think about even Christmas plays, if you will, she doesn't even have any lines, really. Um, I mean, she's just over there, she's tucked away, and, and she's kind of forgotten, unless you're a little girl, unless you're, you're a woman. Because think about it, she stands out as the single female figure in the entire nativity scene. 
Now, we've made the angel, I think, female, maybe for that reason. Let's add another female. When in reality, how about this? Do you know that in the Bible, angels are always male? Always. Even the Greek form of the word is always male. And we even know some of their names. Michael. And we're going to see Gabriel today. Unless you're a young girl who's saying, where do I fit in this story? And today we're going to see that Mary is an example for all of us. And maybe our problem has been that it's been men, frankly, in our seminaries and from our pulpits who've been talking or not talking about Mary. So then we turn to the biblical Mary. All right, this is the blessed, courageous Mary. Uh, and when we read the, just the raw reading of the text, we, we see a confident, courageous, bold Mary. In fact, Scott McKnight, who's a theologian, he writes this. I love this. Uh, listen to this. This Mary utters poetry fit for a political rally. We call it the Magnificat. We're going to look at that today. He goes to, she goes toe-to-toe with Herod the Great, musters her motherliness to, to reprimand her Messiah son for dallying at the temple, follows her fate to ask him to address a flagging wine supply at a wedding. And then she finds the feistiness to take her children to Capernaum to, to rescue Jesus from death threats. This Mary followed Jesus all the way to the cross, not simply as his mother, but as a disciple when his other closest followers had deserted him. She leads us to a Christmas marked by a yearning for justice and the courage to fight for it. Like other women of her time, she may have worn a robe and a veil, but I suspect her sleeves were rolled up and her veil askew more times than not. (laughs) I love that. And consider this, this young Jewish girl would have known the major themes of redemptive story and the prominent Old Testament prophecies that pointed to Jesus. What did she know? She knew a lot, as we will see today. And and what she knew the most, this is what I want you to see today. What she knew the most, she treasured and pondered the great love of God for her. Not only for her, but for her people and for the whole wide world. So... All this took place but even before Luke 2. So in the story, if you want to turn to Matthew 1, I'm just going to um, check out this snapshot here real quick. Matthew 1, 18, it says says this, the birth of Jesus took place like this. So it starts the story, right, after his genealogy. And says that Joseph and Mary are legally bound to get married. And then she discovers that she's pregnant. Now, have you considered that? How about being a teenage teenage woman, likely, a young uh, woman, and she finds out she's pregnant? How did she find out? Well, she would have found out first, probably. And then she's going, what is happening to my body? Probably mom finds out. And I bet you dad then is going to find out, right? And then she has to tell her fiance, I'm pregnant. And Joseph knows he hasn't been with her. He's honorable. He's a good man. He, He stays faithful to her. But because this is such a shocking reality, God sends a messenger to him, right? You may know the the story there. And the angel shows up and says, Joseph, son of David, calls him son of David, which hints at the story, by the way. Why does he he greet him that way? And, And he says, hey, don't be afraid. Stay with her. This young woman, your girlfriend, your fiance now, is about to give birth by the Holy Spirit. And before you start tossing around your favorite baby names, I've got a name for him. His name is going to be Jesus. Yahweh saves. He is going to come and save the world. So Joseph remains faithful, honoring Mary throughout. And then Mary in Nazareth has her own angel then come to her. Named Gabriel, by the way. There it is. Look at Luke 1. Now flip to Luke 1, 28. We're going to hang out in Luke chapter 1. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Now this sounds, initially, this sounds like a strange greeting. Uh, angel shows up, greetings, you know, sup, um, you're awesome or you're favored. But there's more than that. Watch this. Look at this. This really blew me away. It initially sounds strange, but in the Greek, the word favored means graced. Okay. You, it's, it's charis. You might know that word. It's graced. You're the one who's highly favored. You've been chosen. You are loved. In fact, the message puts it this way. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning. <laughs> it's even better. You're beautiful with God's beauty. This is a good translation as well. Beautiful, capital B, inside and out. God be with you. Now, listen to this. Again, it sounds a little strange, 
But this is a messenger, okay, from God himself speaking to her, saying this, God made you. I made you. You are favored. You are loved. You're beautiful in every way, inside and out. You're beautiful to me. You're fully loved. You're fully pleasing to me. You're accepted by me fully. You are favored. You're graced. You are the most beautiful woman on the planet is what she's feeling and hearing. Now, every woman in the room, every girl in the room, your heart's melting a little bit like, I, I am, I'm going to hear that. I'm going to hear that. Uh, it was it was uh, John Eldridge who wrote the book Wild at Heart, a great book uh, for men read years ago. And in it, he says this. He said, every little boy is asking the question. Every man is asking the question, do I have what it takes? Can I be the man? Every man is asking the question. And he says, every woman, every little girl is asking, am I beautiful? Am I lovely? Am I desirable? Am I, watch this, worth fighting for? And God comes to Mary and he says, you're beautiful, you're mine, you're beautiful inside and out, you're gorgeous in my eyes, you're worth fighting for, I have chosen you, you are the one. And then look at verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Not just, whoa, an angel, I mean, that's enough, right? But what is up with all this? Little Mary, Bedouin teenage Jewish girl, God shows up and says, you're chosen, you're favored, you're mine. You are the apple of my eye. I'm over the moon for you. And I want you to see how significant this is. Then in verse 30, she says, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor. Says it again, you've been graced by God. Don't be afraid because you're loved by him. Don't be afraid because he loves you fully. You are mine is what he is saying. And then he ends his his challenge there by saying, nothing you see is impossible with God. Because Gabriel goes on to say, hey, and by the way, he offers up the dish. Gabriel goes, Elizabeth, your cousin, is six months pregnant. I mean, he's like, like, you know, Gabriel the gossip now, I guess, but he's sharing the the news, right? That she's pregnant and, and, and see, nothing is impossible for God. Don't ever forget that. So Mary is receiving all this, this proclamation that she's loved, and she ends up being amazing. Mary is is arguably the model for obedience in all of Scripture. Her obedience, though, here's what I want you to see, is prompted by, God. first, God's great love for her. That's what led her then to be obedient, not only here, but for the rest of her life. She understood what John, the beloved disciple, loved by Jesus, said in 1 John 4, 19. He said, we love because he first loved us. That's where it all starts, right? And and as that verse goes on, or even prior to that verse, it's actually in 1 John 4, 16, 17. This is the memory verse for us uh, this week, okay? And it says this, God is love. And and when, when we take up permanent residence in life, in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. It goes on to say, this way, love has the run of the house becomes at home and mature in us. God has the run of the house when we receive his love and remain in his love. So here's what I want you to see. We come home to his love when we realize that he first loved us. This is the message that not only Mary received that then prompted her obedience the rest of her life. I want you to hear this today. This is the message for every single one of us. You, this is Christmas. You are loved by God, full stop. You're loved by him. But but watch this. We keep on coming home to his love. Mary, this was her first act of obedience, but it wasn't her last. Mary continued to love the Lord and and continue to come home to his love. I mean, think about that. We, We don't just come home once. Yes, you received Christ and his grace once. And if you're watching me, you never have received Jesus as your savior. Today is your day. It's why you're here. But we don't just, just, just not come back to him. And that's really the point here. We continue to come home to his love. What, what would it be if I went off to work or you know, ministry through the day and I'm here at the church or doing whatever I'm doing and then I, you know, kiss Stacy in the, mor- in the morning, good night, goodbye, I'll see you later, um, and then not go home? I mean, that'd be nuts, right? Like at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not going home. 
No, I go back home. I want to go home. That's what love is, right? I mean, that's where home, the house of love is where you live. And as a believer, that's where you live. You come home to him constantly, always coming back to his love. Because if you don't come back home, the master of the house is coming after you. We read it this week in our Advent guide. He's looking for prodigals. He's looking for you today. Have you truly come home to his love? Are you coming home to his love constantly? Because listen, friends, you've got to come home to his love. Teenagers, listen, young people, come home to his love. You're searching for love and approval and affirmation in all different places. Until you come home to him, you're going to search for love in all the wrong places. Some of us adults are still doing it. Some of us men, we need to come home to his love. Some of us need to literally come home and be with those who God's called us to disciple and to love well. Some of you women need to hear again, you are loved, you are, you are accepted, you are fully approved, you are beautiful. You need to come home to his, his love. And define yourself by him, not by everything that you're seeing in the media, what women ought to look like, ought to be like. Turn away from the lies of this world. And you do that by coming home to him. You've been chosen, you're favored, you're graced by God. Come home to his love today. So Mary said yes, and, and, and she trusted in the Lord uh, and his love for her, for his people, her people, and for the world, and she responds with what is called the Magnificat. Uh, now, this is a word in Latin. It comes from my soul rejoices in the Lord. That's what it means. And uh, I want us to close our time by looking at the Magnificat because what I want you to see here, here's the twist. What was Mary treasuring and pondering? She was treasuring God's great love for her. So look at this. God treasures and ponders you. I want you to hear that today. This is Christmas. This is why the incarnation took place. He was thinking about you. And here, here's, here it is. Christmas means that God treasures and ponders his love for us. And that love then leads to action. And this is what Mary does as well. As she ponders, thinks about God's love for her, it led her to action and it does the same for us. To lead us to action, to love those around us and love the world. And so in verse 38 of Luke chapter one, it says this. And Mary said, here it goes, behold, I am the Lord's servant. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Look at this. This is her response. Okay. You're favored. You're chosen. You're loved. Here's her response. I'm a servant. Whatever you say, let it be true of me. I mean, I, I, when that hit me this week, I'm like, I want that to be my life. Friends, at the end of the day, when life is all done, what are you giving your life to? There's only one thing to give your life to. And it, and it comes as a response to God's great love for you. Christmas, he has come. He's died on the cross for your sin. He loves you with an undying love. The only right response is, God, I'm your servant. Say whatever you will. Let it be mine. Let it, be, let, let it define my life. I mean, gang, if we... If, if we could live and die that way, we would bring glory to God in everything we do. And so she says this, look at verse 46, and, and here's the Magnificat. And Mary said, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior. God took one look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman in the world. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. Mary, did you know? <laughs> Look at what she goes on. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength. She's saying he flexed his muscles, scattering the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. Now you're hearing this and you're going, wait, Mary, you're, you're like having a baby. What? She knew. She knew what was happening, that God would choose her a lowly servant because that's who he chooses. She goes on. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised. Beginning with Abraham, right up till now. Did she know? Man, did she know. 
And then it goes on to say she's, she stayed there with Elizabeth for three months. She got two women pregnant at the same time. That was either awesome or really, really challenging. Um, but there they are. But she said yes to, to the Lord. When you say yes to him, every mom knows this. When you're pregnant, it's not just a nine-month deal. It's a lifetime. It's a lifetime. This is the way it is when we say yes to God. So I'm, I'm favored. I'm chosen by you. You love me. I'm giving my life to you. And it's every day, not half-hearted. It's all out. Every single day of our lives. Do you understand the God, God's great love for you today? Do you really understand? Because here's the thing. Frederick Denker, who's a theologian professor, he wrote this. Depth of spiritual commitment is determined by the quality of one's fidelity. That is obedience or allegiance after the majestic voice is no longer heard. And here's what I want to challenge you with. See, all that was happening, Mary pauses, she treasures and ponders what's happened to her. We've got to do the same game over and over again. We'll forget, we'll leave him, we'll, 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 we'll go on our, our, our own merry way apart from him if we don't stay committed to coming back to his love, coming home to his love, constantly coming home to his love. That's the thing. It's his love that prompts us to obedience. And so we obey even as she did. Not in the dramatic moment. It's one thing to hear the word of God and it's transforming. This can be the moment for you. But here's where the power of God comes when we obey. Not, not just, wow, I learned something great today. Or wow, Jeff seems to have studied this passage. He seems pretty hyped about it. No, no, no. When it becomes yours and then you obey it. And you say yes to him. And that's what I want us to do as we close our time is really settle our hearts on him. And if you're humble before him today, he will transform your life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote a book, a um, little book, a little known book called God is in the Manger. He writes this, who among us will celebrate Christmas correctly? Whoever finally lays down all power, all honor, all reputation, all vanity, all arrogance, all individualism beside the manger. Whoever remains lowly and lets God alone be high. Whoever looks at the child in the manger and sees the glory of God precisely in his lowliness. That's who God uses. When we set aside our pride and we come before him. So I want us to do this as we close our time. We're going to close with singing um, Again, just one song as we end our time together. But I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes with me, even at home, wherever you are. Just close your eyes um, to, to focus for a moment. I want us to visualize the baby Jesus. Some of you moms know, remember holding a, for a newborn. But look into the baby's eyes. And consider Mary. Look at your five-year-old son running around the father's shop. Look at the 12-year-old, seemingly more confident than he should be, teaching the scholars about Scripture. Consider your joy when you find him in the crowd after losing him for a few days. Look at him turn water into wine, heal the sick. Watch him preach to the crowds. Watch him speak truth to power. Watch him stare down Herod or Pilate or the Pharisees, cringe as he says things to them that you know are going to get him in trouble. Watch him as his body is pummeled, beaten almost to death. Watch the nails go through your son's wrists and feet as they raise him up on the cross. She gave birth to this baby who's now a man watching her boy die, being executed right in front of her. This is Mary, courageous, joyful, obedient Mary. This is you and me. She's a model of hope, of peace, joy, and love because she just saw herself as a servant of the Most High God. She said, yes. Will you say yes to him today? Friends, say yes to him. He's done everything that needs to be done for you to be saved and for you to follow him. Give him your life right now. It's the only thing to live for. You are chosen. You are loved. You are favored. You are the one he has chosen to save. Say yes to him. I imagine Mary having lived her life, watched her son die. 
she would meet him yet again face to face. It'll happen to every one of us. The Bible said we're all destined to die once and then face judgment. Mary enters into heaven and she sees her son, her savior. She knows now. God treasures and ponders us with an undying love. Come home to love. Lord, we love you and we praise you for your grace today. And we worship you. We remember that moment when you came into the world and changed everything. And now, Lord, may you change us by your grace. May our lives never be the same. As we say, yes, I am your servant. Do with me as you will. In your name we pray together. Amen.